And so if you look at a, like a 10 year time horizon, people that are managing money, active managers, almost 99% of them do not do what we call beat the market, meaning generate a rate of return for their investor that exceeds the S&P 500 average. Alex, welcome to the show today. It's great to be here. Good to see you, Michael. Yeah, good to see you as well. So I, I want to know, you're you're some kind of economics professor, right? Something like that. That's, that's right. They People think that I know I've got some special knowledge or some special crystal ball because I have a PhD. I do know the economic way of thinking, but that doesn't make me any kind of super forecaster. But in yeah. my... In my non-real estate life, I'm a professor of economics at Ferris State University, which is right outside Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I live. Now, we don't get too many economics professors uh, in the profession here. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you look at the, you know, the stereotypes of the, the stodgy professors wearing the bow tie and, you know, you have a you have very proper language and, you know, and, and that we don't really know associate professors were being entrepreneurs, right? Well, this is why we teach. Uh, we don't really necessarily do. And, and They're in the ivory I, tower. Yeah. I'm just and I'm just curious, like what went on? Because uh, it took you a little while to make a decision to to move forward with with this entire thing. But why why were you looking at real estate in general? Like just and then I want to know after I understand what was going on and why you're thinking real estate. I'm like I want to know how you actually decided to take action because a lot of people read Rich Dad Poor Dad and a lot of people want to get rich and da da da, but they never do anything. Uh, but mm -hmm. the, the the real question is why why were you looking at real estate in the first place? Yeah, sure. So let me address a little before that. A lot. It, it is hysterical. I can talk bad about academics. It's all right, and I can, I can, and I can say really anything I want now because I have tenure, and that is, and that's what makes a lot of the academics just kind of lazy and not really on the edge of looking for the next opportunity or really seeking financial freedom because they've got kind of cushy lives. Like it's good work if you can get it, and. Um, and by the way, you want to ask me any question about is college worth it, et cetera? Absolutely not going to hurt my feelings. Like as, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of degrees are just signaling that you know how to show up and on time and listen to an authority and really be a good employee. And I don't know that a lot of degrees going to do a lot for your human capital, so to speak. Economics, of course, not being one of those degrees. But we want to have that conversation. I'm not going to at all be... Um, insulted. I'm not of the opinion that everybody needs to go to college just because I'm because I'm a professor. I became interested in real estate and entrepreneurial type things from a very young age. And really, it started because I went to graduate school in a very expensive market, Washington, D.C. And I could I just couldn't afford to get a small apartment for myself. And I was amazed at how you could buy something and rent out the rooms and that I could live for very cheaply or maybe even nothing. And, and that got me thinking about how, wow, you can take an asset, chop it up, make it more valuable. And, um, and I, I ended up writing a dissertation about how contract law leads to better and worse economic growth in different countries. But it's really, it's real estate that inspired that. So when I was 21, 22 years old, of course, the bank had no faith in me, even though it, in my mind, made a lot of sense. So they uh, let me buy some house in Northern Virginia and rent out the rooms. And um, and so I couldn't get into real estate because I didn't have a real job. I was a student, right? And so what I started doing, though, just because I was, I was, a I was fascinated with the idea of you buy something, cut it up into different pieces, and rent it for more money. This was back in 2013, 2014, when Uber X was really becoming a big deal. I went out and I bought um, a half dozen Toyotas, bought them all pretty quickly before they all hit my credit report. And then I started renting them out to people that wanted to drive on Uber. Maybe they didn't have a car, they didn't have a hybrid, they didn't want to use their personal car, whatever the story was. And I was renting out my $10,000 Prius for more than $100 a day because I was renting it out to different people and on the same day. And so that, that was a lot like real estate, but just a, applied to the car level. And that required, that taught me a lot about managing people, it taught me a lot about budgeting for maintenance and repairs. And that was such an involved business that all I could do the whole time 
was as I was, and I did about 3000 trips my, myself driving for Uber. And I spent a lot of that time listening to your podcast. And so, of course, as I'm doing something entrepreneurial and as I was shut out of the real estate game, all I'm doing is comparing buying cars and leasing them to drivers with buying apartments and leasing them. And I'm really thinking about the scalability of it. But why you asked why real estate specifically, and I come at it as an economist, so I'll give you an answer that maybe other guests don't give you. I take what's called the efficient market hypothesis very seriously. And so that's a fancy word for the idea that there are not $20 bills just laying around on the sidewalk. In other words, if there's a profit opportunity out there, the economist is like, you're wrong. There's probably, there's probably some smart entrepreneur that's already taken advantage of that profit opportunity. Now, of course, if you're an entrepreneur, you can't think that way. You can't walk around and think, yeah, all the profit opportunities are gone. So these, these, these two types of mindsets are in conflict, right? But I take pretty seriously the fact that entrepreneurs are smart and profit opportunities do get scooped up. And I am, I've always been fascinated with how, and maybe you're aware of some of these statistics, if you look at people who manage money, like a hedge fund manager or what they might call an active fund manager, those people only do what we call beat the market, which I'll explain in a moment. They only beat the market um, about 5% of the time or less over a 10-year period, meaning that if you hand your money over to a money manager, and of course, you've got to pay them some, some fees to manage your money, that they need to generate a return for you above some benchmark. Because of course, you could take your own money and buy an index fund. Like you could invest it in the S&P 500. And over the last 30 years, that's returned something like 10%. And so if you're paying someone to manage your money, they need to generate at least 10% for you, right? And if you look over and if you, and, and they need to generate that net of their fees, and of course, net of the risk that they're taking on on your behalf. And of course, these guys get paid whether or not you make money. And so if you look at like a 10-year time horizon, people that are managing money, active managers, almost 99% of them do not do what we call beat the market, meaning generate a rate of return for their investor that exceeds the S&P 500 average. And so to me, that says two things. Wow. It is really hard to beat the market. You better know what you're doing. But that also means, too, if I'm going to get off my rear end, go out there and look for an opportunity, try and run my own business and not just buy the S&P 500, which I could do completely passively, then this means I need to know I've got a very solid chance of truly beating the S&P 500. And in the finance world, they call that generating alpha, generating a rate of return over some benchmark. And your benchmark should never be zero. Maybe it's not the S&P 500, maybe it's government bonds or some other more conservative investment, but your benchmark is never zero. And so I start thinking about which asset class am I gonna truly generate alpha in? And I'm convinced that not just is that real estate, but that is multifamily real estate, where in any economic environment, folks need a thousand to thirteen hundred dollar a month apartment to live in. They need that in every major metro. I don't know what Google or Facebook or Amazon or Netflix, I don't know what they're gonna come out with that's gonna destroy demand for apartments. I, there's no macroeconomic reason to believe that building is gonna get any cheaper or any easier. Right. And so there are all these fundamental reasons why multifamily real estate made sense to me. And while it looked like a compelling asset class to try and generate true alpha in. And so that's why I started chasing it. You're such an academic. I love that, though. But on the other hand, I have not ever heard it like that before. And it's, it's a higher probability play to build alpha than almost any other asset class. Again, I wouldn't totally use agree. those words, but I've said the same thing using different words. But here's the other question. You said it earlier. You, you know, you have tenure. And when I, when I hear that, there are a lot of people mm -hmm. I speak to that are actually high income earners, just in general, and their life ain't so bad. And I find this a problem. In fact, I just released a video on this exact topic. I'm, I'm basically saying if you're a six figure earner, you got a major problem if you want to be financially free because your life ain't so bad. 
You know, my life ain't yeah. so bad, but I don't want to work for the next 20 years, but my life ain't so bad. So why throw it out the window? Why have to explain mm -hmm. to your friends and family that you are about to embark on this entrepreneurial journey to burn financial free and I'm going to quit my job? They're like, why would you do that? You're an idiot, right? So why go down that road? And, you know, in your, in your particular case, you're a tenured professor, very similar. Why would you go down this route? What made you actually go down that route and overcome that huge inertia? What if four videos could give you everything you need to build $10,000 a month in passive income in as little as 180 days? I've proven it many times over and so have hundreds of other people just like you. And one of the best ways we discovered to reach financial freedom is by investing apartments. Now, I know that sounds like super advanced, but the truth is you can get started today. You don't need years of investing experience. You don't have to have millions of dollars in the bank. So register for the free masterclass Apartments 101 today and take that first step and to really discover how you can build true wealth for yourself and your family. Let's do this. Two big things, all right? And I'll try to make, I'll try to not be as long-winded as I can be. We want to talk about some of the deals you've done, Alex, but this is an important question sure. because it sure. holds a lot of people back. I, guess I understand, understand. There, there are two reasons. Um, and I think that one, one you understand if you're just have an entrepreneurial mindset is there's, there's almost no other option. But two, those people that are the high income earners, you're right. They have a huge problem because they have, they have no sense of how fragile that income is. And I am uh, fortunate to have been in a situation where, um, where I had to sleep in a car during graduate school and where I got denied, I got denied one time on a housing application. I didn't make enough money to get approved for a rent controlled apartment. And I know that there is just no kind of stress like not having money. You just do not have the same kind of of control over your destiny. You are not thinking about the you, the people. You're exactly right. The people that are earning hundred hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, they have maybe never had to think about the kind of problems that somebody that has nearly nothing has to think about. And the people that have had nearly nothing, they are well aware of how fragile a high earning income is. Like a lot of those folks, they are one divorce one medical emergency, one family member's divorce or medical emergency away or one change in their boss's attitude um, away from not having very much. And you, they need to have a plan B. And not just that they need, it's, it's actually deeper than that. It's not just that they need to have a plan B. They need to feel the satisfaction of being totally and completely in control of how much income that they produce, Right. And this is the great thing about the United States of America. I've got I, I have a lot of students in my office all the time that they're they're so paranoid about their GPA, what they're going to major in, like what the rank of the law school is they're going to get accepted to. And all I can do is think to myself, like it just it just if 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 you can if you can really learn to be a good entrepreneur and be self reliant, like in the United States of America. The major, like what is printed on a piece of paper with your name on it, like just who convinced you that this has got so much power over your destiny or what you're going to be able to do in life? There's there's no limit, and the and you're right. The people that are comfortable have never got. They don't have the opportunity to confront that reality, and therefore they're a little bit blind to all the opportunity that there is out there at the same time. So what fortunately pushed me to not be complacent is just. I've been in a situation where I've had literally no money. I've been in a situation where I needed to support my siblings and my parents. And that was not fun at the time, but I'm grateful for that situation because I'm not complacent. Yeah. The second part is the second answer to that is um, I love what I'm doing and I believe what I'm doing. And this is what learning a lot, of, a lot of economics just won't teach you. Like you can be, you can be a really good at underwriting. You can be a really smart business person, but at some level, what you need is a very compelling mission, like for yourself, for your life. And let me tell you why. I was in the airport a couple of weeks ago, and I came across another professor that happened to be boarding up the plane that I was. And he's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to this town over the weekend. I'm looking at this hotel that's for sale. And 
And he's like, like, how many properties do you have? How many hotels do you have? Like when he's like, you, you economists, you're such capitalist pigs. Like, when is it enough for you? And I thought to myself, like, I didn't, I barely knew how to respond to this guy. Cause I thought to myself, I, I never think about enough. Like I don't have some hedonistic goal about, um, you know, a bunch of Ferraris or big houses or these kind of things that you experience through your five senses in life. Like these things are ultimately not motivating. I think to myself, well, I have the capacity to go out there and create more safe and affordable housing. And I can make the tenants' lives better. I can make the investors' lives better. And I'm excited to do that. I think that I'm I'm good at doing that. And so I want to, I want to flourish. I want to develop those those capacities of mine. And I want to, I want to make sure that I'm multiplying those talents that I've been given. And that's just, that's, that is innately motivating to me. And so if folks haven't found out exactly what that is, and especially if they've never been broke, yeah, it's going to be very hard to break out of that comfy job. Yeah. I find a lot of motivation also is just being able to control your time, I think. So it's mm-hmm. B, it's not going back to every money, but it's also really time, time control. And the honest truth is, you know, entrepreneurs that they quit their job, they they actually work p- arguably harder than they did their own job. The difference is they control how they work and they're not working for themselves. And that's very powerful as well. Now, I know you joined our mentoring program. You actually just said, hey, this is pretty cool. I'm going to need a help. I'm going to work with uh, a team of, of experts. And we typically obviously teach you how to find deals and, and raise capital. And you learn all those things, but you kind of put a twist to it. How did you change the traditional apartment strategy and made it make it work for you. I will I will do that. If you don't mind, I want to just go back for one second. For those people that are in that hundred thousand dollar a year job that I think that they we make this mistake often in our thinking. We think that if something is familiar, it's safe. And lots of things that are familiar are safe. But just because something's familiar doesn't mean that it's safe. And therefore just because something is different, that does not mean that it's risky. Some stuff that's different is risky but one doesn't imply the other. That's the fundamental breakthrough that I think those folks need. The different twist on it was, and I don't want to discourage anybody out there, but so I'm, and by the way, I've I've attended a ton of your events and, um, and, and purchased different programs from you. I mean, starting maybe back in 2018 or 19, like right when I was still purchasing, you know, two unit here, four unit there, 10 unit there, before I really was able to scale to large properties and syndication, I knew that's where I wanted to go. It it took some time. And one thing that I was um, in kind of what was holding me back was I know that in the business world, what you don't want to do is compete on price. Like I would hate to be selling corn or soybeans or watermelon. Like when you go to the grocery store, you never look at what farm your watermelon came from because you don't care. All watermelon to you is kind of the same. So how do you get ahead as a watermelon guy? You got to compete on price. That's tough. You got to somehow be more efficient than the next guy and they they could probably copy you. You've got to have... So the way that a business really is able to not compete on price is they one, either have some kind of IP or they have a differentiated product and they've convinced maybe via marketing and positioning, they've convinced their customer that I'm worth paying more for because my product is different. Like that's Starbucks all day long. The coffee is not that different. The environment's a little different. The experience is a little different. They've convinced you that they're different enough that you go to Starbucks and pay a little bit more than going to McDonald's. And so applied to syndication and the multifamily space, I'm looking at a whole bunch of folks out there that are trying to buy the C-class property in the B-class neighborhood or the B-class property in the A-class neighborhood where it's mismanaged and it needs a few hundred dollars. Uh, we can bump the rents of hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks by doing some remodeling. And then we're going to crank up the value. We'll either sell or we'll refi or both. And that's a great business model. But I was worried that everybody was doing that. And so I tried to do that. And I was, and I would say mildly successful in doing that. But as interest rates really came down in especially, right, 21, 20, um, and 2020 and 2021, rates are coming down, cap rates are going straight down. And I'm asking myself as an operator, like, what 
what unique advantage do I have? What unfair advantage do I have? How am I going to get the off-market deal that is not passed on to the more experienced guy? How can I get better debt terms than the more experienced guy? How do I get my construction to be more streamlined than the guys that have, are vertically integrated in their construction? And one answer to that question is you just work harder and a little bit of luck is required to just be the right per- to be the first person to find that off-market deal or just be at the right place in the right time. And there are people that scale that way. But I thought to myself, what I need is a niche where I'm not competing with everyone else. And I stumbled into this kind of by accident. I was at a conference, and which, are, which is a phenomenal use of time and energy. If folks ought to have a minimum amount in their monthly or annual budget to be going to conferences. Like the ROI is that and books. You pretty much can't overspend on those things. You get so much out of them. And this is a great example of why. I'm at a conference and I happen to be talking to a, a broker at a conference. And he says, there is a hotel for sale in your, in your area in Grand Rapids. And we ought to go and look at it together because I think that it makes sense as a conversion to multifamily. And I thought to myself, this sounds like an absolute outrageous pain in the ass. Like we are going to go to the city and get this thing rezoned to multifamily. And then we're going to take the franchise off the building. Most hotels have franchises on them. And then we're going to add a kitchen to every unit. And then you want to talk about value add, like, and then you want to talk about vacancy. Then we're going to have, essentially an empty building that we have to lease up from zero to make it an apartment complex. All of these things sound like huge barriers. They all sound hard and they are all hard. But one of the rules that I try to live by is that whenever you encounter a problem, you put a price on it and you get really good at getting a, putting a price on it. Like a lot of experienced real estate guys, they don't go to a house and say, this is too ugly. It needs too much work. They don't say that out of principle. They put a price on what the house needs in order to and to see whether or not it's worth investing in. And so I sat down and did the same thing with the hotel. And that was hard to do at first. It's very hard to do. There's a lot of moving pieces. And what I realized is that all those problems I named off to you, having conversation with the city, getting the franchise taken out, adding the kitchens to the rooms, and then getting it leased up from zero, those problems are just frankly worth solving. And they're worth solving for a handful of reasons. Number one, hotels trade at a cap rate that's in the mid to upper teens, right? They trade at a much lower valuation, right? Higher cap rate, lower valuation than multifamily. And this is why. A cap rate is at some level a measure of the durability or the projected or anticipated durability of a property's income. Well, hotel income is very variable. It goes like this. And hotels are also very management intensive. If you don't have the right housekeepers, if you don't have the right marketing folks, then your occupancy suffers. And as a matter of fact, most hotels are marketed and and are evaluated by how much revenue they bring in, not even by the NOI. And that's because who the operator is really matters that much in the hotel world. So you've got hotels that trade at much lower valuations to multifamily, number one. Number two, business travel has not rebounded since COVID. Number three, what I came to appreciate is that unlike an apartment, a hotel has a very lim- has not a very, but more limited lifespan. So a hotel might start off as a Marriott courtyard. And five, seven years go down the road, Marriott demands that the hotel remodel according to the Marriott standards with the Marriott paint and with the Marriott furniture, so forth and so on. They call that a PIP, a property improvement plan. Sometimes the owners can't afford the PIP. And sometimes the PIP is twenty, thirty thousand dollars a unit. And the hotelier says, this is just not, it's not worth it. And there is no negotiating with Marriott about their brand standards. So at that point in time, maybe then it becomes a Best Western. And then after a few years of being a Best Western, it becomes a Super 8. And then it becomes what I consider the the kiss of death. It becomes an Oyo. And then after it's an Oyo, it's just mom and pop hotel. And they, they're in the death, I call it the death spiral, where they drop the average daily rate to try and boost occupancy, but occupancy doesn't pay the bills. 
they're attracting a crowd that is um, that is bringing crime and other unseemly activity to the hotel. They're not saving to remodel. And the hotel owner ultimately has got an asset that's deteriorating and they cannot afford to do the capital improvements that the property needs and they're ready to sell. But hotels in great locations, they've got great amenities. And so we've, so that those can be purchased really cheaply and cities, not every city, but a lot of city, un, a lot of cities understand that these older problematic hotels and motels that are attracting crime and other unpleasant behavior um, that they, these properties have no future and they would love to see them turned into affordable housing. And you contrast that with the multifamily side, right? All the people that listen to this podcast are looking for the C-class property that in the B-class neighborhood that they can buy, upgrade, and bump the rent on. And everybody that listens to this podcast knows about how unaffordable single family homes are right now and how people that are renting have record high incomes. Oh, we've got all these people crowding in to the multifamily space. And the people that used to live in A-class are now kind of living in the B-class. And the people that used to afford the B-class property, now they've they've kind of been pushed into the C-class. And the people that five years ago were in C-class, where are they going? Like those people are really constrained. And that's why as you kind of go and look at the lower grades of properties, well-run low-grade properties have amongst the lowest vacancy rates in all of multifamily because those folks just don't have anywhere else to go. So you've got all these hotels that can be purchased cheaply in great locations. And at the same time in multifamily, that's where all the demand is for affordable stuff. And that's exactly where none of these developers can afford to build. There is a lot of there are a lot of headlines right now about this record supply of multifamily coming online, but you dig in and look at exactly where that supply is and exactly what those properties look like, and they're essentially all Class A properties. And so I thought this is the niche that I am going to follow. I am going to make a rule where I don't look at other multifamily, not because there aren't great opportunities out there, but because. I want to be an expert on buying hotels and converting them to workforce housing. And that's going to take a lot of, a lot of practice. And so I'm not, I'm not going to get distracted. That's what I want my brand to be. So from that realization at that conference until closing the first deal, that took about 18 months, right? That was hard, but now here we are. And I'm and I'm excited to tell you about some of the metrics on the deal we just closed. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask you how it's going because uh, because you know this is the thing when when things are are tough, you kind of start look. In this case, tough to buy. But having said yep. that, it's been tough to buy multifamily for the last eight years. The market's hot. Now it's cold. Now there's COVID. Now there's interest rates. Right. So right. Uh, what I love about this, I think I, I, I always love change in use of something. This is why uh, the whole idea of short term rentals was so cool. Right now, mm-hmm. I think uh, I can pay market price for a house. Heck, I can overpay market price. I'm changing the use. I don't care because I'm going to make right. way more money. And so right. you're taking a hotel, like, I don't care. I'll give you more than you're asking because I'm going to do this this different thing that's exactly. going to be more profitable. And so exactly. I, I like the appeal of that. I, I really do. So yeah, to share with us how, how the property, how it's going and some of the metrics, I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Sure. Sure. So, and I'm, I'm glad to tell you about like exactly the types of hotels that I look for and, and the conversion process. Like when I started doing this, there are very few people. I've got a list of what I believe are less than 20 people in the country investment groups that have ever done hotel to multifamily conversion. It's very new. And so at first it was tough. You'd call the lender and to try and get a loan. And they say, well, is it a hotel or is it a multifamily? <laughs> You'd call and try and get insurance. And they're like, well, is it a hotel or is it multifamily? You'd try and you'd try and talk to the city. Well, are you going to run it temporarily as a hotel? When exactly is it going to become an apartment? All these people telling you no, 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 no. But to your point, it, when you're changing the use, like I'm glad there are those, those barriers, right? Those are just opportunities to crack the code. And that's why I'm able to buy this stuff so cheaply. So for example, I'm actually sitting in the property right now that was built in 1985 as a 250-unit Holiday Inn. That's a pretty big hotel for a non-downtown convention center hotel. I know in the multifamily world, 250 units might seem kind of mid-sized, but in the hotel world, 
I would say that like franchised hotels, kind of two, three star and lower, you really don't see them much over 150 units. So 250 units is a big hotel built in 1985 and it had gone down several flags. Owner was distressed behind on his water bill, about to be behind on his taxes, this kind of thing. And at some point in time, what I really liked about this property, at some point in time, somebody combined all of the rooms. Now, I typically don't like combining rooms just because you go from a studio to a one bedroom on net, you're not getting more rent from one 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 bedroom versus two studios. Sometimes you got to do it because maybe you don't have enough parking or because you've got 250 units and you're worried about demand for 250 studios. In this case, somebody had already come through and combined all of those units and taken the unit count down to 120, but there were true now one bedroom units of almost 600 square foot per unit. And I was able to buy that for $28,000 per door. Okay. <laughs> my, my going in cap rate is, I know this sounds fake, uh, my going in cap rate is almost a 22. Okay. Unheard of in the multifamily space. And so what that means is not just big upside, but that means I'm protected on the downside, right? Rates go up, Armageddon happens, rents are flat, et cetera. Like when your basis is $28,000 a door, or you can afford to cut rents to places that folks across the street just can't afford to. So $28,000 a door, and we're, we're spending right now with labor and material about $13,000 a door remodeling. This property already had um, fire sprinklers in every room. It already had kitchenettes in every room. And so from, from that standpoint, the conversion is straightforward. And because it was built as a 250 unit property, we have a ton of parking. Well, some hotels, they actually have some of them, some of them have fewer parking spaces than rooms, if you believe it or not, because they're not designed to run at 100% occupancy. So it took some time to right, find the right property. But now, boom, what's cool about this one, too, is um, an old hotel is not exactly the kind of thing that a bank is very happy to finance. And sellers know that you can push them for seller finance terms. We purchased this property. Um, we've got 36 months of interest only seller finance at um, 7%. I paid, uh, so I said 20,000 a door, purchase price is 3.4 million. I have an as is appraisal for 4.55 million, right? That's with no value add. As a hotel. Here's the other, as a hotel, Yeah. as a hotel, yeah, yeah. right? And, and we're projecting even at an eight cap, to take this thing to about a nine and a half million dollar valuation once the renovation is complete. So there's there's real arbitrage in the cap rate, right? I'm buying at the hospitality cap. And when it's converted, this is not just a I'm physical a conversion, it's a financial conversion. And I'm getting the multifamily cap rate once I refinance. That's amazing. And it's a lot of headache to do it. But well, but it's it is worth it. Uh, if you if you can figure out that ditch, uh, yeah. I think that's that's uh, really a cool model, and more people probably don't do it. I would imagine because the barrier to entry is is probably bigger. Like you said, there's a lot of things to figure out. It's not so cookie cutter. You can't just go get a loan easily. You have to be creative in order to get into it. Um, so that's that's really cool that you've uh, been able to figure that out and use that as your niche. How many of these have you done? This is the first. So I've been part of others that of bigger groups that were investing in them. Like I came in and try to watch what they were doing and try to help out on the construction side. This is the first one where I'm the lead GP on it. And, and Michael's law of the first deal is absolutely true here. I predict to you in 60 days, we're going to have another one closed and going as well. Boom. That's Boom. Insane. Awesome. Yeah. Alex, I think we're, we're running out of time here, but how can people reach out to you if they need to get a hold of you? Yeah, sure. I'm, my website is villicus.capital, V-I-L-I-C-U-S dot capital. And, um, and I'm also on LinkedIn, Alex Cartwright. Absolutely happy to chat with anybody. And I am active in Michael's DMM community online for folks that are members of that. I've met a lot of great people in there. I get a lot of value out of reading those posts. Highly recommend that to all your listeners. 
That's awesome. This there has you been go. great, Alex. It's, it's been amazing to see your journey from uh, when I first met you. And, and I love your resourcefulness and really uncovered something. So congratulations, man. I cannot wait to Thank see you. what you do next. Thank you. Thanks for the time, guys. It's a pleasure.